people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. For the people over there at Boxer and Sky Sports, Lauren Price and Karis Artingstall go pro with Boxer and Sky Sports. Olympic bronze at Feather and Olympic gold at Welta. I think a lot of people were expecting Eddie Hearn to pick up these two Olympians. But Lauren Price and Karis Artingstall both believe they can be in contention for world titles within 18 months after the Olympic golden couple announced they will be turning pro with Boxer and Sky Sports. Price, who won middleweight gold in Tokyo, where Artingstall won featherweight bronze, said they had a stack of offers, some life-changing before picking Boxer. Price will make her debut in early May, where Artingstall will be on a show in Manchester in June. I like what's happening here. And I told you, the presence of more than one major platform in the United Kingdom, signing female fighters, female talent, makes things very interesting and very competitive for the existing platforms that are out there. The existing outfits, Queensbury, Matchroom. Queensbury hasn't made the same level of investment in women's boxing that Matchroom has made, though all the same, the presence of Sky and Boxer really shakes things up, given these recent signings. Lauren Price and Karis Artingstall. The pair, who are a real-life couple, have not boxed since Tokyo, and Artingstall said she had initially considered remaining amateur for the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham this summer. Price, though, who won Olympic, World, and Commonwealth Games gold as an amateur, said the decision was a no-brainer. It feels like a while since Tokyo, but over the last four years and the cycle we've been on, we needed that break to step away from boxing. Being in Sheffield full-time and the extra year added on with COVID, Price said, it was good to come away for Tokyo and experience the limelight. We were at different events, the GQ Awards and stuff. It was good to experience that, and we went away on holiday and had some downtime. But she said both had soon tired of the celebrity lifestyle. After about three months, we got a bit sick of it. We wanted to get back in shape, Price said. We'd put on a bit of weight and just wanted to get back in the gym and look trim again. I've won gold at every major, so for me it was a no-brainer. From the age of eight, my dream was to go to the Olympic Games. I've achieved that. I needed a new goal. Lauren Price is a welterweight. That's 147 pounds. Where Jessica McCaskill currently reigns as that division's undisputed champion. And in spite of Lauren Price's ability, her ceiling, a very high ceiling, her being a blue-chip prospect, a blue Blue chip prospect who they're likely going to move fast through the ranks. I don't actually think Lauren and Jessica are going to cross paths. They are in very different stages of their careers, and the politics of boxing could get in the way because Jessica McCaskill just signed a matchroom. She signed a multi-fight deal with them, whereas Lauren, she's with Sky Sports and Boxer. Lauren Price, who has a win over Savannah Marshall on her record, but will be boxing as a welterweight in the pro ranks. I'm tiny for middleweight, Price said. Back when I started on the amateur scene, welterweight wasn't about, and I got ranked at middleweight. Then I won a few medals and became world number one, so it made sense to stay there. In the pros, I will be moving down to welterweight. I have been on the scene with Savannah, Clarissa, and seen what they have done putting it on the map in 2012 in Rio, and now the standard just gets better and better. Savannah headlining shows is not just great for women's boxing, it's great for women's sport. It seems to me that Sky Sports is going to have the run of the place at the higher weights. Where Eddie Hearn and Matchroom might have the run of the place between 118 and 147 pounds, it seems to me that the people over there at Sky in the not-so-distant future, they might have the run of the place anywhere between 147 and 160 pounds. They've got Lauren Price at welterweight. Georgia O'Connor and April Hunter at or around super welterweight. Savannah Marshall and Clarissa Shields at middleweight. That's not even all they've got, though. It's not. Lauren Price added, even though we have the amateur background, being a professional is something else. Obviously, we're going to go a bit quicker, but I am just looking to take a little step forward each time. 14 to 18 months is realistic. Realistic 
to fight for a world title. Karen Sarding stalls on the same time. Harding Stahl sees herself on the same time scale, but says she needs to learn the ropes as a pro. I know it's the same sport, but we do need to mold into professional fighters, Harding Stahl said. I want to step up every fight I have, and it is down to how well I step up. I think it will be relatively quick. I'm going to debut at featherweight, but might move down to super bantamweight. I'd say it is a bit busier at super bantam than feather for me, so we'll see where I fit in. I watch pretty much every boxing show that is aired, so I pretty much know all the female fighters that are around. Super bantamweight is a bit deeper, a bit busier than featherweight. Featherweight, that's 126 pounds, where Amanda Serrano is a unified champion. She's got the WBC and WBO titles. Mexico's own Erica Cruz holds WBA title, and Denmark's own Sarah Mafood, who's going to be in action very soon against Nina Menke in defense of her blue belt. She's got the IBF title. Super bantamweight, you have Venezuela's own Mayerling Rivas holding the WBA. She very recently signed to Matchroom. So you've got Mayerling holding the WBA. Jamie Mercado, who holds the WBC title. France's own Sigaling Lafarve holding the WBO. The IBF title, that title is currently vacant. Nobody's holding it. But that blue belt will be on the line very soon when Australia's own Shernika Johnson takes on Mexico's own Melissa Esquivel. Essentially, in the very near future, there will be four active reigning world champions at 122 pounds at super bantamweight. That's likely why Karras views that division as a busier division, a busier weight class. There's more going on down there. Sky Sports and Boxers Stable of Valkyries is shaping up nicely. Very impressive. Impressive indeed. You have Karras Ardingstall, Lauren Price, Carolyn Dubois, who's already made a fan out of me, Savannah Marshall, George O'Connor, April Hunter, Ebony Jones, Natasha Jonas. Shannon Ryan. They look set to give Eddie Hearn and his Valkyries a run for their money. And, you know, while that might make Eddie's job a little little harder and Frank's in the greater scheme of things to the consumer the fight fan it's a more competitive market that requires that these promotional outfits and platforms stay on their toes cross all the T's dot all the I's put on the best content the best shows they can so it's actually beneficial to the consumer very exciting times very exciting signings the vast majority of these fighters have very high ceilings and they're all young and strong For the most part they are young fighters like Shannon Ryan Georgia O'Connor Carolyn Dubois Ebony Jones this is is the next wave. Sky Sports is a major platform, an established one in the United Kingdom, one that many of the fight fans over there are already familiar with. So these girls are going to get maximum exposure. Eddie Hearn might have more familiar faces and familiar fighters than Sky Sports does. Right now he does. But Sky Sports is a platform that more fight fans are already familiar with, more familiar with Sky than DAZN comparatively. So believe you me, things are going to get competitive. It's We are a ways out from the politics. We are a ways out from things becoming political because many of these fighters are in the beginning stages of their careers. They're not exactly on the cusp of fighting for world titles just yet. But at some point... We'll see. In men's welterweight news, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, per a tweet from my Coppinger, Alice is talented. An undefeated 28-year-old welterweight was promoted by Golden Boy Promotions and hasn't fought since October of 2020. A win over Alexis Rocha, a win that's aging nicely, I might add, should have plenty of opportunity with how stacked the PBC is at 147 pounds. That's right. Rashidi Speedy Ellis has now signed to the PBC and he will be integrated into their welterweight stable. For Rashidi Ellis, who hasn't boxed in well over a year. It was Good move. the right move to make. In some ways, the only move to make. He doesn't have the luxury of a loyal domestic following like a Conor Ben over there in the United Kingdom to whiz. He doesn't necessarily need to be fighting for a world title in order to sell tickets and drum up business, make respectable purses. Conor Ben. Most guys don't have the luxury that Conor Ben has. The drawing power that Conor Ben does as he's making his bones through the pro ranks. Most welterweights out there, they don't... Yeah, most guys ain't got that luxury. For Rashidi Ellis, this was the natural choice. And I don't know why Golden Boy Promotions didn't get more fights for this guy. I don't understand why he's sat out for as long as he's sat out. Since October of 2020, well over a year's time has passed. I don't know exactly what the issue was, but I do know that this was the right move to make. Now, do I expect to see Rashidi Ellis in there with the Keith Thurmans and Danny Gershas of of the world? No, I don't, because to those fighters, those established welterweights, those guys, this guy's a high-risk, 
Low reward. 28 years old, sporting a pro record of 23 wins, no losses, no draws. 14 knockouts. The last time out, he took Alexis Rocha's unbeaten record. He took his own. It's hard to imagine that either Keith or Danny would want anything to do with a guy like Speedy Rashidi Ellis. I think that both of them jointly have spent enough time swerving Jaron Boots Ennis. Yet another unbeaten prospect, another fresh face in today's welterweight division. Jaron Ennis, Rashidi Ellis, these guys are the next wave. The next cycle of welterweights, while guys like... Danny Garcia, Keith Thurman, they're just sitting around getting older, collecting dust. The PBC have fortified their stronghold over the welterweight division. In that division, in that weight class, the PBC might be lacking in a lot of other areas, a lot of other weight classes, a lot of other divisions, but not between 147 and 154 pounds. At those two weights, they've got the run of the place. They need fresh faces. The ones, their previous stable of welterweights are on the back nine, a circle in a drain. Sean Porter's retired. Danny Garcia is toying with the idea of either moving up to 154 pounds or potentially taking on Terrence Crawford, but I don't think anyone favors Danny Garcia to beat Terrence Crawford or win a title at junior middleweight for that matter. And Keith Thurman, he just went 12 rounds with a guy that got knocked out at 140 pounds. He decisioned him at 147. That old crop of welterweights has gone about as far as they're going to go. PBC made the right decision, signing... Rashidi Ellis and bringing him into the fray and Rashidi Ellis himself and his team, they made the right decision migrating to the PBC because what the fuck was Golden Boy doing for them? And what could they do? Three out of four alphabet titles at welterweight are already on the PBC side of things. Could soon be four if the rumors check out and Terrence Crawford goes over there. Not only do I think this was the right decision for Rashidi, I think it was the only decision. That's the way I see it. And just in keeping with the theme of welterweight news, former welterweight champion Danny Garcia on Terrence Crawford, that's a big fight. We have history. He needs needs somebody like me. No, he needed somebody like you a couple of fights ago. A few years, actually. He needed you before. He don't need you all that much here today. Not next, said Garcia of Fighting Crawford in an interview with Fight Hub TV. But that's a big fight. We have history. I feel like he needs somebody like me. But he doesn't want to fight Terrence Crawford next. In truth, I don't want that to be Terrence Crawford's next fight anyway. Danny Garcia hasn't fought since late 2020 when he dropped a one-sided decision to Errol Spence Jr. So he's coming off a loss and a year-long stint of inactivity. Well over a year. He's not the ideal candidate for a Terrence Crawford fight. I'd rather see Terrence take on Keith Thurman, who's gotten himself back in the winner's bracket. Mario Barrios, of all people. The rumor is Terrence Crawford's supposed to be going into a two-fight deal with the PBC. And one of those fights is supposed to be a Keith Thurman fight, so I like that fight better than this one. He continued, like I said before, there is no big fight in the welterweight division without Danny Garcia. All you gotta do is look at the numbers. When Keith Thurman fought me, there were 16,500 people in the Barclays Center. There were 5 million people watching. His very next fight, when he fought Josecito Lopez, there was nobody in the stands. Nobody cared about about the fight. When I fought Porter, we put 14,000 in the Barclay Center, did crazy numbers on Showtime. His very next fight, he fought Jordanis Ugas in California, and there was no one there. No one even cared about it. So all you gotta do is look at the numbers. There's no big fight in the welterweight division without Danny Garcia. Numbers don't lie. All you gotta do is check the scoreboard. And if we check the scoreboard, you know, when Errol Spence Jr. fought Sean Porter comparatively, it did better viewing figures on pay-per-view than Danny's fight with that same Errol Spence Jr. All you gotta do is check the numbers. Danny Gersha, in giving his examples as traveling ways back, ways back into the past. The Keith Thurman fight of, what was it, four or five years ago? The Sean Porter fight three years ago? Why don't you talk about something a little bit more recent, like your fight with Errol Spence? And how Errol Spence Jr. put up better numbers with Sean Porter than he did with you, and you were the last guy that he fought. The last guy that he fought on pay-per-view. Both of those fights were pay-per-views, but comparatively, Errol did better numbers with Sean than he did with Danny. That's why Danny's going so far back in the past for examples of his metrics. Danny Garcia, who stated, I would love to fight Keith Thurman again. I would love to fight Kel Brook. I would love to fight Mikey Garcia or potentially a Terrence Crawford fight. And if the rumors check out and Keith Thurman ends up being the first guy that Terrence Crawford fights in his two-fight deal, if that ends up being the first fight of that deal, well, that takes him out of the running for a Danny Garcia fight, leaving Danny to contend with Kel Brook, if he's willing to travel. Don't hold your breath. He mentioned Mikey Gersha. Lol, Mikey Gersha, who's coming off that big upset loss to Sandor Martin. Sandor Martin, a 140-pound fighter. For what it's worth, I actually think that 
Mikey Garcia versus Danny Garcia could do decent at the box office. The commercial value of that fight, the age-old Puerto Rico versus Mexico rivalry. It's a fight that could do decent business, so I'm not sure that Mikey Garcia would want to get in there with a welterweight, a full-blown welterweight, when he just lost to a junior welterweight. Don't get me wrong, the fight actually makes a little bit of sense because they're both coming off of losses. Both guys need to shake off the cobwebs a bit. Both guys have spent a little bit of time outside of the ring. Danny more than Mikey, better still, they both need to get themselves back in the winner's bracket. It's a commercially viable fight. Compared to what else is out there for Mikey, Danny would be a safer choice compared to what else is out there. And the same applies to Danny. Danny would sooner get in there with a Mikey Garcia than a Rashidi Ellis, than a Jaron Boots Ennis, and we already know he doesn't want to fight Terrence Crawford next. Not that I think he should. Yeah, not that I want him to, I don't. Comes down to preference. I would actually rather see Danny Garcia take on a Jaron Boots Ennis or a Rashidi Ellis more than I'd like to see a Keith Thurman rematch. Traditionally, that's the role that a former champion, a seasoned guy like a Danny Gersha, that's the role a fighter like him at this stage in his career, that's the role that he is intended to fulfill. A familiar face, a capable fighter, a serviceable one, that, that young unbeaten fighters can use as a stepping stone because that's what he is. Guy who's living in the past, guy talking about metrics from a Keith Thurman fight that was what, four, five, six years ago, something like that? No elite level wins in the welterweight division. Still living off of victories from something like, I don't know, nine or ten years ago, the American Khan fight, the Lucas Matisse fight, you do realize that it's been roughly nine or ten years since he boxed those guys. Yeah, the Amir Khan fight was in October of 2012, and the Lucas Matisse fight was in September of 2013. He has no elite-level victories at welterweight. Danny Garcia has often been the recipient of many, many participation awards, just for participating, but not actually delivering, not actually performing. Always a step behind the elite-level guys, what were perceived as the elite-level guys when he fought them, a step behind behind Keith Thurman, a step behind Sean Porter, a step behind Errol Spence Jr. There's people they actually laud around the name of Danny Garcia like he's somebody that Terrence Crawford needs to fight. Even more ridiculous is that Danny Garcia was actually already offered this fight some years ago, approximately three or four, in 2018, late 2018, when Top Rank offered him $3 million up front, $3 million guaranteed, and a share of the pay-per-view's upside. And Danny, Danny was more concerned with fighting Adrian Granados and Ivan Redcatch. You know what it reminds me? me of it reminds me of when Bob Arum offered Adrian Broner a Pacquiao fight. Something like three years before he actually fought Manny Pacquiao, that's right. In 2016, Bob Arum offered Adrian Broner a Pacquiao fight. Bob said, problem was, Adrian wanted more money up front than Manny Pacquiao did. Fast forward, Adrian don't fight that same Manny Pacquiao. Some years later, in 2019, after he's older, lost a couple more fights. Also, that he could end up crying broke on Instagram. Demanding that Al Heyman give him the rest of his money. It seems to me that Adrian Broner didn't warm up to the idea of that Pacquiao fight unless it were to happen on the PBC side of things. I think the same rings true when it comes to Danny Garcia and Terrence Crawford. All of a sudden, he's warming up to the idea of fighting that guy at a time when Terrence Crawford may be crossing over to the PBC side of things. We may be a day late, a dollar short, as Terrence Crawford has bigger fish to fry. His name is attached to two guys, two guys that already beat Danny Garcia. Keith Thurman and Errol Spence. So Danny, Danny might in fact be a day late, a dollar short. He needs to get himself back in the winner's bracket, and I don't know how he's going to do that, because I don't think he wants to fight guys like Rashidi Ellis and Jaron Boots Ennis. He's been out of action for over a year. Is he now doubling back on his plan to move up to junior middleweight? Is he going to decide to stay at 147 pounds a little longer? Is that what the plan is? Is now? I don't know if you can tell, but I ain't got a lot of time for Danny Garcia. I don't. Or a lot of patience.